This morning I'm, I'm going to speak briefly about uh, the theology of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer as it relates to disability. But I want to give you a little bit of context first. Uh, Jeremy mentioned a, a book which I just happen to have here, which is Disability in the Christian Tradition. Uh, and what we've been trying to do in Aberdeen is to reclaim the, tr the Christian tradition, in a sense, for disability theology. Because there is a, a running theme throughout some disability theology that wants to push against the past and suggest that everything that was gone before is not good, but only what we have now is the thing that we need to, to look after. Um, Jeremy, I think, in his presentation yesterday over Leviticus, opened that up very nicely and suggested and opened up the possibility that actually the past is not quite as dark and dangerous as we might have thought. Indeed, it may well be a place of revelation. And so the under, one of the underlying ideas behind uh, this project is that time doesn't really move on in the way we think it does. You know, as moderns, we think time is constantly progressing on, and, and, and through progress, we can get to somewhere that will ultimately be a, a place of goodness and peace where we can all live happily together. Actually, God, time is a, more of a perception than a reality. God lives outside of time. We live inside of time, and because we live in creation, it feels as if it's real. And when we, when we feel as if time is real and moving on, we tend to neglect the past. But one of the important principles behind this project is that what God said two, three, four hundred years ago through these theologians, through the prophets, through all these things, is not just for two, three thousand years ago. It's a word for now. In other words, God's revelation is God's revelation, no matter what period of time it was given in. I think it's really important that we think about that. And today I'm going to be thinking about, uh, well, Hans pushed towards that yesterday looking at John Calvin. And today I'm going to be pushing in that similar direction in relation to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Because what God said to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he also says uh, to us. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, a German theologian who uh, came to the fore, really, uh, during the Second World War because of his stance against the Nazis and his stance against the atrocities that Nazis um, perpetrated. But also, his deep concern was that the church itself was quite happy to be implicit in some of the atrocities. It was quite happy to be part of the regime that was actually act acting in what he considered to be a deeply ungodlike manner. And so it was in that context that he begins to develop his ethics uh, and his practice and his theology. And the key thing about Bonhoeffer is that he lived everything that he, did, he, he, he uh, wrote. As a theologian, in a sense, his theology is his autobiography. Indeed, you could argue that all theology is autobiography to, to a greater or lesser extent. And he stuck with his principles to the extent that he was prepared to die. He was arrested. He spent many years in prison where he wrote some of his most fa fascinating work, the prison letters. And then eventually he was hung with a piece of piano wire in Flossenburg just three or four days before the uh, liberating troops came to, to uh, put a stop to the atrocities that were going on. So his life is fascinating, and if you're interested, you should really, really uh, take on board what he said. Today I want to, uh, to pick up on one aspect of uh, Bonhoeffer's thinking, uh, and that's in relation to his stance on the value of human bodies and it stands on the value of human lives. And that's where I want us to go this morning, to think about that in relation to disability. First of all, a quote from Bonhoeffer himself. Life created and preserved by God is an inherent right, completely independent of its social utility. There's no worthless life before God because God holds life itself to be valuable. Because God is the creator, the preserver and the redeemer of life, even the poorest life before God becomes a valuable life. And the key point there is life is valuable and loved, not because of what anybody can do or not do, but simply because it is created life. Now Bonhoeffer is known for many things. However, perhaps one of the most of his formative of, of his experiences is often overlooked when we consider the origins of the, his actual work in theology, practice, and ethics. Bonhoeffer's thinking was profoundly impacted by the time he spent in a little community in Germany called Bethel, in Bielefeld in Germany. The Bethel community comprised of around 1,600 people, all of whom had some kind of disability. 
Bethel was in a village that existed solely for the sake of people with a disability. Now, can you imagine the contrast between Bethel and uh, the concentration camps? There we have a little community purely for the weak and the vulnerable. Next door we have a place that's purely for destroying the weak and the vulnerable. So Bethel was very powerful symbolically. After Hitler ascended to power, Bethel, like all such facilities, was required to submit the names and details of all of its patients, ostensibly for record-keeping purposes. But the truth was that inside the Reich, terms like useless eaters and life unworthy of life had become common reference in, uh, in relation to people of Bethel and other similar institutions. The idea of useless eaters is, why would you waste your money feeding these people? Unworthy life, what would be the economic point of keeping these people alive? In fact, the Nazi regime was preparing for war. There were food shortages uh, that were expected as a result of the, the war. Uh, and basically, they were beginning to prioritize who was important and who was not important within their society. Now, contemporary arguments for euthanasia on the grounds of economics and pragmatism are certainly not new. They're borrowed. So it was against this backdrop that Bonhoeffer spent time in Bethel worshipping with people with disabilities. Arguably, the thinking that he developed here in relation to disability was foundational for his later thinking in relation to the Jewish people and how people's attitudes should be. As Bernd Vonovich points out, it was Bonhoeffer's first-hand experience of Bethel as a place of embodied neighborly love that made him aware of the reality of the church that still knows what the church can be about and what it cannot be about. Let me say that again. Bethel points out a way of being church within which the church still knows what the church can be about and what it cannot be about. Now, his point was that whilst the established German church uh, continued to comply with the Nazi demand for total obedience to the Fuhrer, Bethel remained a model, a symbol, an example of the true nature of the church, a place where brothers and sisters are sustained by God in forms of weakness that are an affront to worldly power. So on one occasion, after returning from a service in Bethel, which comprised of people with epilepsy, elderly tramps, deaconesses, theology students, pastors and, and their families, along with many other people with different kinds of disabilities, Bonhoeffer wrote a, a letter to his grandmother, uh, Julie. Again, Bernd Vonovich points out that in the letter, uh, <coughs> Bonhoeffer admitted that for the first time, it really struck him how the lives of disabled persons revealed something of the truth of human existence. A truth that so-called normal people, people typically try to ignore, are actually a paradigm, a model of what it means to be human. Human beings are by definition weak, vulnerable, contingent, dependent, with little power on their own. In particular, the situation of people with epilepsy struck Bonhoeffer as revealing. The experience of seizures uh, shifted the boundaries of how health and wellness could be understood. Their movement between health and sickness, life within the seizure and, and, and normal life out with the experience of the seizure served as a strong reminder of the fragility and uncertainty of health. And most importantly, what Bonhoeffer de describes as the defenselessness that characterizes human life at its very core. To quote Bonhoeffer, he says this, their situation of being truly defenseless perhaps gives these people a much clearer insight into certain realities of our human existence. The fact that we are indeed basically defenseless, that can, uh, uh, is the essence of what it means to be a healthy person. Bethel was a place then for Bonhoeffer of revelation. It's a place where he suddenly realized what the church looked like. He suddenly understood what it was to be a human being. It was a place that revealed the reality of universal Christian brotherhood and sisterhood and the centrality of weakness and dependency. Bethel was an embodied recognition 
that all human life is essentially feeble, defenseless, and dependent, and so revealed neighborly love as the very fabric of human sociology. To love one another is the fabric of, of human sociology. Not to do things, but to love and to be loved. So it was not power and personal attainment was the mark of humanity. It was interdependence, contingency, and vulnerability that was the ontological mark of humanness. Something that Stanley Heyerwass learned from Bonhoeffer and applied to his work with profound learning disabilities. And something that Jean Vanier discovered through his life with people who have intellectual disabilities. I don't know if Vanier ever read Bonhoeffer, but he certainly lived him. You need to lose your sense of being a powerful individual in order to gain your true self. So Bonhoeffer's experiences in Bethel and the reflections on humanness that emerged from that uh, that revealed to him just how insane the Third Reich's euthanasia program was. And I use the word insane quite deliberately. It's a form of madness, Bonhoeffer says. If our natural state is one of defenselessness, dependency, contingency, and vulnerability, any suggestion that it could be justified on utilitarian grounds that people with disabilities were not worthy of life because they cannot do certain things or think in certain ways makes absolutely no sense. None of us can do anything without others and ultimately without God. None of us can think properly without the spirit renewing our minds. This is why Bonhoeffer can talk about the Nazi elimination of disabled life not simply as wrong or morally corrupt, but precisely as mad, insane, such an approach was completely out of touch with reality, even if it felt real and proper and ethically right. It was madness. Bonhoeffer puts it this way. What utter madness that some people today think that the sick can or ought to be legally eliminated. For Bonhoeffer, it's not the disabled or the mentally ill who are insane, says Bernd Vanovich. It's those who assume that they can distinguish their own healthy existence from the handicapped in a way that actually severs, uh, severs the bond of all humanity. In other words, those who think that their health is to do with the absence of disability are mad. So to believe such things puts one out of touch with reality, and as Christ is the only truly at reality, it puts them out of touch with Jesus. Now, to bear that in mind the next time we hear politicians try to justify policies against disabled people based on the fact that this is a realistic policy. Because the word realistic, unless it's defined by Christ, uh, Bonhoeffer says, opens up forms of madness that we don't even notice. So what we see in Bonhoeffer's thinking about euthanasia is an illustration of what he describes as a theology from below. He puts it this way. And this is interesting. It remains an experience of incomparable value that we have for once learned to see the great events of world history from below, from the perspective of the outcasts, the suspects, the maltreated, the powerless, the oppressed, in short, from the perspective of the suffering. That we come to see matters great and small, happiness and misfortune, strength and weakness with new eyes, that our sense for greatness, human justice and mercy has grown clearer, freer, more incorruptible, that we, that we learn indeed that personal suffering is a more useful key, a more fruitful principle than perhaps happiness for exploring the meaning of the world in contemplation and action. What he's saying there is that when he looks at the community of Bethel, when he sees people with disabilities, when he sees people with epilepsy, he sees true humanness. When he looks to the Third Reich, and when he looks to the way that human power is being used, and more importantly, the way that humanness is being defined, then he sees nothing but brokenness. He sees nothing of God there. So God is found when you look, start from the bottom and you look up. There you see God. So alongside of Bonhoeffer's critique of the Third Reich's policies of euthanasia and a, a new anthropology from below, the understanding of what it means to be human from below, bless you, was a similar critique of the model of health that underpinned Nazi 
ideology, because health was fundamental to the way that uh, the Nazis justified and, and acted out the program of euthanasia. So the attitudes of the national socialists towards disabled bodies was shaped by a certain understanding of health. So within this perspective on health, there's respect for the so-called healthy body and disgust for those bodies that do not seem to be uh, normal in that sense. As Vasluis puts it, the health of physical bodies is related to the understanding of the health of the community. The underlying assumption is that there is important congruence between how we view our bodies uh, and how we view our communities. So the types of bodies that the Nazis despised and considered to be unhealthy were a direct representation of the types of community that they sought to build. So the fact that they, they uh, can tolerate disabled body, bodies and understood them to be unhealthy is a direct reflection of the type of community that they were aiming to uh, develop. So attitudes to disabled bodies were uh, pointers to the desired nature of community formation. Now we might want to bear that in mind when we reflect on, for example, current views in prenatal testing. The fact that disabled bodies point to the type of community that we hope to have. Within the perception of health that drove the Nazis, life was considered to be an end in itself. In other words, your life was absolutely everything. Uh, there was no future life. Your life as it was was everything. Life in itself became an absolute good, or goal rather. To put it in Bonhoeffer's words, life became mechanized. In the same way as a machine was considered to produce something, <clears throat> so too were human beings. In the same way as one discards a machine if, it's, if, it, if it is or is unable to uh, carry out its tasks, so human beings were being discarded on a similar basis. So if it's no longer useful for a machine, you throw it away. If it's no longer useful for it to have a human being, you throw it away because it can't do the things that you're supposed to do. The National Socialist government was prepared to subordinate the interests of genetically disabled individuals to the general welfare of the genetically healthy German people, and thereby the flourishing of the German nation. So disability was right at the heart of that conversation. Such unlimited domination over life inevitably leads to a loss of meaning and value for all life. If life is just for life's sake or for the sake of doing something, eventually you lose your value for about the whole of life. What's the point? If human beings are only of worth for their utility for what they can do, then human life across the board loses its value. If everyone is expendable on utilitarian grounds, the greatest good for the greatest number, then aging, sickness, disease, and disability take on a quite particular meaning. And that's really, really important. It's important for our society to think about that. If we only exist because we can do certain things, then we end up in a kind of nihilistic state where nobody is safe, nobody is comfortable, because we will take a time when everybody cannot do certain things. So Bonhoeffer's reply to all of this is both interesting and relevant to current discussions of life and value for disabled people. He notices that the term natural has become confused in the various debates. The Nazis were always using the term natural, that, that disabled life was unnatural and that the Aryan state was the natural state. And it became very cute, uh, complex about what the natural actually was. Now Bonhoeffer suggests that we need to retrieve the gospel meaning of what it means to, for, uh, to be natural, or if something means to be natural. And he says this, the natural is that which after the fall, after creation falls, is directed towards the coming of Jesus Christ. So creation falls, uh, Jesus comes to redeem creation, and that movement of redemption in creation is what he calls natural. The unnatural is everything that stands against that. So the natural is that which participates with Jesus in, in the redemption of the world. The unnatural is that which decides to do its own thing. So within natural life, bodily life bears intrinsic right to preservation. Bonhoeffer says this, he says, human bodies, all bodies are created, are created and inherently valuable. There's no worthless life before God because God holds life itself to be valuable. Because God is the creator, preserver and redeemer of life, 
Even the poorest life uh, uh, before God becomes valuable. Even the poorest life before God becomes priceless. And that's a radical difference from the way in which the Nazi state... I tell you, it's a radical difference from the way in which many people within our societies, from politicians downwards, think about that. People are valuable not because of what they do or may not be able to do. They're valuable because they're creatures. So Bonhoeffer doesn't want to romanticize the challenge caused by incurable genetic disease. It must, however, not be seen as an attack on the existence of community. The sick must not be treated as guilty. In other words, he's not denying that some genetic conditions can be very difficult to have and very difficult to live for, but they must not be seen as a threat to the type of community that any society wants to create. They must not be seen as guilty of spoiling the community, is really what he's saying. So understood in this way, it's easy to see why Bethel became important to Bonhoeffer. Here in that small worshipping community of difference, the fragility of the human condition and the defenselessness of all human beings could be seen, could be touched, could be understood. And the power of diversity and unity could be seen, believed, and acted out in a way that offered a powerful counter to the ongoing murder of people with disabilities. For Bonhoeffer, the gospel needs to be seen to be believed. It's not simply a cognitive thing that we know. It's something that has to be seen to be believed. The church is the place where Jesus is found, seen, and touched. Bethel was both, both a prophetic sign and a revelation of our true humanity. And it was also a powerful call to the church to be the church in some of its most difficult times. So just as I move to the end of what I want to say to you, let me think, help you to, us to think a little bit about what Bonhoeffer's thinking around the issue of humanness, around the issue of euthanasia and value. What does that say to us today? Well, to begin with, the suggestion that the Nazis had that certain people with disabilities were useless eaters, i.e. that they were not worthy of spending resources on, is profoundly relevant. There's a case going through uh, the UK courts just now exploring the possibility that people uh, who choose to uh, carry on with uh, uh, the birth of disabled children, uh, even though they know they're disabled, should be financially responsible for that. And that's something that I know Hans pointed out years ago as a possibility. Well, it's certainly something that it may well become a possibility, particularly in this time of real uh, austerity. In the UK, and you, can, and you can work out how it runs here, we, uh, we're broke. We don't have any money. And so the big political cry is for austerity, which basically means that the poorest people within a society seem to bear the burden of, for, uh, for, of the mistakes that the richest people in our society have made. But what I've noticed recently is the kind of language that politicians have used and the language that's very common in the media that stigmatizes people with disabilities in a way that wouldn't have happened five, ten years ago. The reason for that is that one of the biggest bills the government has is disability allowance, so therefore one of the biggest cuts that's going to happen is in the disability allowance. But the problem with the language that you use of, of scroungers, of, well, not quite useless eaters, but things along these, these lines, is that it creates a persona for society and it opens up people with disabilities in very vulnerable ways. And so there's some serious uh, cases of people attacking people with disabilities, pushing them out of their wheelchairs, so on and so forth. It's becoming dangerous to be poor and it's becoming dangerous to be disabled. So I think what Bonhoeffer is saying and the position that he lays out for us in relation to uh, the value of disability and the theological and practical basis for that is highly relevant. And it's something that our churches need to pick up upon. The question is, do they? Bonhoeffer's big frustration was that the church was quite happy to be a Nazi church, quite happy to go along with the, uh, the policies of the day. The challenge for our churches is, are we the same? Are we quite happy to go along with the, the policies of today? Martin Buber says that the... Uh, to love something or someone is very easy because you have to do something. If I'm going to love you, I have to do something. I have to reach out. I have to engage in certain practices. To uh, engage in evil, you just have not to do anything at all. You just don't have to think about it because you move into love and you slide into evil. And just now, I think the challenge for all of us is to uh, ask our churches, are we moving into love or are we sliding into evil? 
Secondly, Bonhoeffer's observations on epilepsy and health are really interesting. I mean, the basic point he's making is that one, one, one moment a person is healthy, next minute they're not healthy, next minute they are healthy. In other words, health is not an absolute context. It's something that comes and goes. It moves along a continuum. And <clears throat> all of us are healthy and all of us are unhealthy in that sense. And there's no place that we can, any of us can go where we can point, you're unhealthy and I'm unhealthy in the negative way that the, the uh, Third Reich did. So the question of health, which I want to talk to you about tomorrow, is really important. What does it actually mean, theologically, to be healthy? Because I think it doesn't mean what many of us think, and it doesn't mean what much of our culture thinks. And thirdly, and uh, finally, really, no, penultimately. Uh, yeah, if you're a Bonhoeffer person, you'll understand. The impact of, uh, the impact of Bethel and Bonhoeffer is really important because you see exactly the same thing with the impact of, of John Vanny and Larsh and Stanley Hauervast. Stanley Hauervast is, is a theologian and an ethicist who has written a lot about profound intellectual disability and a lot about the Larsh communities. And one of the things he says about Larsh communities is uh, they're a place where the gospel is seen. In his book, uh, 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 Against the Grain, uh, the Grain of the Universe, He's, he makes a very strong statement. He says, the gospel needs to be seen to be believed. The gospel needs to be seen to be believed. In other words, the only exposure that people will have to God very often is you and I. But he says, he wants to argue that communities like Bethel, communities like uh, Larsh, are symbols, signs, and pointers to the concrete reality of the gospel, which needs to be seen to be believed. And the very final thing I want to say about Bonhoeffer in terms of his overall life is when you look at his life, it looks like he's, uh, he's failed. He tried to kill Hitler. Um, he was put in prison, and ultimately he was killed. Um, but there's two things that, that I, I would draw to your attention to. First of all, for, for Bonhoeffer, ethics wasn't simply to do with right and wrong. It was to do with being faithful to God. So sometimes what is right can be wrong, and sometimes what is wrong can be right. For example, it can be, it can be most of us would say it was wrong to lie. But if somebody came to your door with a machine gun and asked to speak to your wife or your grandmother, and you said, yep, she's upstairs, then you might want to ask a few questions. So sometimes the morally correct thing is to say, I have no idea. So lying is, is kind of ambivalent uh, in that sense. Um, likewise, uh, <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Likewise, murder, we, we, we may argue, is always wrong, and certainly it's one of the commandments. And certainly for Bonhoeffer, because he was in, impl implicated in the, the, the call for Hitler, if the, the, the plot to murder Hitler, he never tried to justify that as a right thing to do. He always considered it to be a wrong thing to do, but it may well be the right thing to do in the grand scheme of things. So sometimes you have to do what, some things that seem to be wrong to do right. And it's, it's a rather bizarre concept. But the thing for him is that he always knew that even when he did something wrong for the right reasons, he may still be under judgment. So he never moved away from that. Well, the key thing for Bonhoeffer in terms of his overall life is this. It may look as if he failed. It may look as if he didn't succeed in what he did. He, he did. But Bonhoeffer's slant would be like this. The task of Christians is not to uh, be on the winning side is to be faithful to the tasks that are given to you. And I think for all of us here, that's maybe a very profound and important thing to take away. Our task is not to be on the winning side. Our task is to be in God's side and to be faithful to the things that are given to us. Thank you.